We're going to be in Deuteronomy 8 today. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 8. We're going to take a glance at the whole chapter. It's not very long, just I think it's 20 verses. Um, we've been doing these series in the family and uh, when I labeled the modern family and I guess that could be considered some kind of clickbait or trickery because it wasn't really modernism. It's just what I meant was just for people living, you know, modern people in our time and trying to live with biblical standards and that kind of thing. And, and how do we live with a culture that's telling us everything that we're doing is wrong? So that was my, and we have some uh, younger generations in the room with us, and I'm trying to uh, consider what it's like to be a person that's not my age, <laughs> uh, to be quite honest. And uh, I was once a younger guy, and obviously, you know, I'm not that guy anymore, and some of us are probably thinking <laughs> themselves or God that I'm not that guy anymore, and that I would be one of them. Anyway, um, uh, I was reading through Deuteronomy, and I've been through Deuteronomy. Most of you guys know I've been doing the Old Testament because uh, we're in First Kings right now and, and on our Wednesday nights. And I know the New Testament is chock full of stuff that we that's directed to Christians. Not by the name Christian, but we know as believers that's is directed to us, and we know the Bible is directed to us. Uh, but I think a lot of times the Old Testament gets looked at as almost like old news or just something that's it, it's relevant. Yeah, we get it, but it's just kind of like I don't know. It looks a little boring. Let's read something else, something a little bit more applicable. Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, that just, that's a bunch of rules, isn't it? And God's really not like that. So he's more loving in the New Testament. So let's just kind of stay there. And lots of new preachers usually do. They stay in the smaller epistles that you see in the New Testament. Uh, anyway, but because we're here, um, in my readings, I should say, that's why we're here. Um, there's a lot of re relevance to the Old Testament. And what we're going to see in Deuteronomy 8 is wonderfully applicable to all of this. We've been talking about, like I said, the, the family, the roles of men and women, the husbands, the wife, and the children, and all that. Uh, and I don't mean to gloss over by saying that, but we need to move on. But what I'm saying is uh, all those things start you know, with the foundation of, the, of what God decreed for men and women and, and men and women and you know Genesis uh, and we saw last week in the last few weeks we've been talking through marriage and divorce how Jesus affirmed that so nothing changed from the Old Testament from Moses uh, from God giving it to Genesis to Adam and Eve in Genesis to Moses to Jesus then to Paul it's all the same God doesn't change his mind Malachi 3 6 comes to mind I am the Lord I change not and I love that verse that King James Version so Deuteronomy 8 is about remembering as we've been learning on Wednesday nights and it is vitally important to remember you look through the King, uh, the the first and second Kings. You look through the history of all believers from the beginning of time till now, and you see this constant, constant reminder, reminder, reminder. And I made comments before about when we when I started here in John when we first came here. I, I made several comments to Melinda over the last couple of years. I, I've always feel like I'm saying the same things over and over. John is always describing through G, the, uh, the lens of telling Jesus' story the false believer and the true believer the false believer and the true believer and how to come to right understanding of Christ and of course that's his overall aim and we all champion that we, we, we applaud that, we, we agree with that we, that's our heart, that's what we 
we, uh, we love to do as Christians. We love to tell other people about Jesus. But it's so often that we have to constantly remind ourselves, daily it seems. And I'm going to use this illustration <laughs> that uh, if you guys remember John Baxter, uh, he told me this. And this is great. Uh, he, he was a Navy diver. Um, and he used to tell people, you always have to remember to breathe. Uh, and he got into physical therapy after the Navy, and he's always reminding him. The bulk of his time ministering to people as a physical therapist assistant or whatever or in the Navy was always, you got to remember to breathe. You got to remember to breathe. And when he got out of the Navy, he got out of doing, um, I don't know if he got out of the PTA business, but uh, he ended up going into some kind of martial arts or mixed martial arts or something. And he said he got taught by the instructor because he realized or he didn't realize that he was holding his breath so after 30 something years of telling people to breathe remember to breathe now he had an instructor telling him John you gotta remember to breathe and it happened so fast to us we forget so quickly I talked about it Wednesday night. The you see this uh, and, and from Moses to Joshua, and I thought about going there one day. But Moses tells Joshua to pass these things on, and we talked about Deuteronomy six, and we talked about from parents passing on to their children and their children's children, and remembering why the Passover was there, and all these things. And then the first generation out of the gate, when Mo, when jo Joshua dies, and they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And it was that way for the next 1,500 years. And constantly back and forth, back and forth. So remembering is the theme. You're going to see that in verse 2. You're going to see it in verse 18. So let's, let's, let's start reading through Deuteronomy 8. And we're going to explain and talk about these passages, these, these texts in here. Um, and that's really all I got as far as introduction. Uh, it's not some big whimsical thing or these great illustrations, these big stories, these quotes. That's it. So let's just go ahead and read uh, through the verses. This is Moses speaking to the people about what God has been telling them. Verse 1. All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. Here it is, right out of the gate. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years. This is very, very important. They just got, they had a massive detour for 40 years. It was in part for their grumbling. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as the verses go on. There are some parts where that touches their, you know, if he touches on their memory of that. Actually, that's all through here. But uh, part of it was because of their own ignorance. Part, or I shouldn't say ignorance. They're, they're testing the Lord. They're putting the Lord to the test. Uh, not trusting in the Lord. And we'll talk more about that, like I said. But what I'm saying here is, um, dang, I just forgot. This is why I like my notes, but I'm really not wing. I don't have much here, so this is it. <laughs> um, anyway, let's just go on. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. The testing is not just because of their grumbling. That, that was part of it. But if you recall back in the Old Testament, part of the issue was the, the land they were going to wasn't ready. Why wasn't it ready? Because the Amorites have not reached their full sin. Their, their full sin has not come to its time. We wonder why Jesus came when he did. It wasn't right to come until it was time. It was appointed and the Lord knew. And the sin of the Amorites and all those people had not reached its full to its height. And that's when the Lord would bring them in. And then they would be judged by the people of Israel. Would be used essentially the way that the Lord used Assyria to judge Israel later on before their exile to Babylon. He's using, he'll use them here to judge the other nations. 
And actually Moses will talk about that a little bit. Let's keep reading. So you remember, you are to remember all the way which the Lord, your God, has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you could keep his, I'm sorry, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, I want to say a quick word about that. It's not that God doesn't know. He knows. This is the same way it was used in Abraham. Now I know that you will obey the Lord. The Lord is not wondering, well, I'm not sure, so I'm going to put him to the test. This is not the way he's speaking. This is so they'll be grown to a certain point of obedience to understand. And you'll see that throughout this text because the adjectives are used all over the place. Uh, the adjectives are used in verse 3 understand verse 4 you will know verse 6 you will keep you will walk you will fear all these different verbs are used to help motivate them and he's been using these things to motivate them so when he's testing them it's for them to get through the trial not for God but for them to know And so he says, he humbled you and let you be hungry. You wonder why the tests come? Because he's growing you. You're not ready yet. For whatever reason, he's moving you to a newer place of maturity in your Christian faith. This is vital to understand. So when the test comes, you don't throw up your hands and go, all right, you know, this is it, I'm done. I, this is what the Israelites did. This is why they were killed in the desert, because they got to that point. Why did you bring us here, they said to Moses, to kill us? You brought us out here from Egypt, you saved us from the Pharaoh, and you brought us out here to die? And not at all. But he's testing you which means he knows you're going to make it through, right? If he's testing you, he's not bringing you out there to die. He's bringing you out there to grow you. It's just a specific reason. The test is for a specific reason. You don't take a driver's test unless you're going to end up driving at some point. Now, we may fail the test and have to go do it again, but that's, that's on you. But what he's saying here is he's humbling you. He let you be hungry. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that, the, that man does not live by bread alone. Have we heard that before? That sounds familiar. But man lives on everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That's his point. He's trying to get you to understand. He's trying to go, bring you to the source. The source is God. The source is everything that comes out of the mouth of God. And I've said this example before, but I used to tell my dad, not everything is about Jesus, dad. Not everything is about God. I'm talking about I can't pay my bills and you're talking about God. What does that have to do with anything? How am I supposed to pay my bills with a Bible verse? I just didn't, it just didn't under, it didn't compute. But we're going to see a little bit. Everything that we have is from God. The breath to complain about God is from God. Right? Listen to what he says. And, and look at, and if you think that he's testing you beyond your means where you can't, I don't know, I can't take this kind of thing. This is, I'm not built for this. I'm sorry. I, I can't kind of go through this. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. He will sustain you supernaturally if he has to. A lot of times we don't have to be sustained supernaturally. Or actually we can be though. I heard about a story uh, as well this week. Um, a friend of mine said he was doing yard work and um, felt the Lord telling him I need to go take out some money and go help this individual 
Okay, Lord, fine, I'll go do that tomorrow. That's what he said. And then he felt God. And I, you know how you guys feel about, you know, the, the he felt and stuff. I mean, I, but I do think in some cases God may move through people and individuals. And in this case, uh, he felt, nope, I need to go right now. So I went over there and he talked to the lady and the lady said, yeah, I just happened to come back from vacation and uh, my water was running the whole entire time I was gone. And I'm, my bill is $320. And he says, I literally came over here to give you this $300. I think in certain ways, God will sustain us at times. I don't think that's the norm I don't think we should go out like testing God to go, all right, Lord, well, I'll buy that new car when I know I don't have the money to pay for the monthly payments, but let's see how this works. That's way irresponsible, I think. You don't do that. But you know that everything that you have comes from God. You don't live on bread alone. God sustains you. What I'm trying to help you understand is you don't, need to worry and we'll eventually do a series on anxiety and worry but I think this passage is sufficient to talk about that and you remember flip over to Matthew 4 real quick and we'll talk about something a little different I do want to talk about how this played out with Jesus Matthew 4 is pretty interesting This is Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Think about something for a second. After 40 years, 40 days, 40 nights, he became hungry. Yeah, you think so, huh? Jesus was brought there to be tested. And he gets forty days, forty nights with no food, and he's hungry, and he knows where his source is. He knows the absolute source of everything because he answers Satan. Satan says in verse three, the tempter came and said to him, "If you are the son of God." Command these stones become bread. And he answered, knowing, of course, that he is God. But he says to him, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. Skip down to verse. Eight. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him. Now, everyone usually likes to talk about a little incantation that you can say to the devil and he'll flee. That's not what that verse is about. That's showing you that Jesus succeeded where we fail. Ask yourself, how are you going to be after 40 days of not eating? And someone says, I'll give you the power to make a stone turn into bread. You say, give me that power. I am starving. Right? I want this. I want you to do that. I want you to give me this. We fail because we don't seek after God usually. Usually our first go-to is some other source besides God. You see it over and over. That's why I have us going through 1 Kings. But we saw it last week where one king went to another king outside of Israel and said, Hey, why don't you help me do this thing over here and help me get rid of my enemy who is the other guy in Israel, the other king. Judah, they're kind of aggravating me right now. And I can't help them. They won't, I can't get around them. So I want you to help me come over here. He saw an outside source rather than trusting God. 
I take this upon myself sometimes. I think, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? I mean, what am I supposed to do, Lord, with this church if it's not doing what I want it to do? It's not growing, or in some type of a way, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. And then I remember, like what we were talking about in our Wednesday night. And I'm sorry, I'm going back there a lot. There's so much coming out of that. Uh, and I go, well, if if God told Jeroboam, I'm taking the kingdom from Solomon. It was one united kingdom. I'm going to split that kingdom into two. You're going to have one half. God sent a prophet to him, and the prophecy came true. Now, right then and there, that king should have known. Okay, I'm, I'm confirmed as king. The prophet told me it actually happened, right? And I can trust that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. He made me king. I should be confident in that. And yet, what did he do? Well, all the people are going to go to Jerusalem and worship God down there. And they're going to see that king and they're going to go, well, maybe we should just stay in Jerusalem instead of this guy. He didn't trust. So then he made other systems of design of worship to try and keep what he had. When he should have trusted what God said he was going to do. And we know that when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it, right? And that's what he's saying here. Everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, your clothing did not wear out on you, your food, your, your feet did not swell these 40 years. Thus you are to know, verse 5, back in Deuteronomy 8, thus you are to know in, the, in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Right? Hebrews 12. You know you're a believer because you're being disciplined for your sin. Therefore, verse 6, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. We're supposed to remember these things. We need to keep these things fresh on our mind. They need to be ready in our heart. We need to remember what God has done for us. Remember what he's promised you as a believer. If he's taken you through life and you're going through a particularly hard storm, you got to understand and know in your heart, right? Understand verse 3. Know in verse 5. Know in your heart that the Lord is disciplining you and he's growing you. We think of discipline as like a bad thing. Like I was bad and someone disciplined me. God disciplined me. My parent disciplined me. But that's... The discipline is for a disciple, a follower, someone who belongs to. That's why he uses it in that way. Just as a man disciplines his son. It's not just about correcting someone in rebuke or bad behavior. That could be applied there. But it's also for growing you. Moving you to the next stage. Something you can be ready for. Israel wasn't ready for the new land just yet. And the Lord knows that. So he's moving them to that. He's growing them through that. Now, the group that was through the desert for 40 years ended up dying off because they, they weren't going to go. God says, no, you're not going. You're so obstinate. You're not going. Right? And now this is the group that's going to go in. And listen to what he says in verse 7. He's warning them about what's going to happen. So he says, Moses says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, and a land of wheat and barley, of figs and vines and fig, I'm sorry, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and of honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig up copper. One thing you need to know about this land. We think about that and we think like, wow, this is like some magical land. It's almost like heaven. 
you think about it in terms of like it's a it's like a place like it sounds so wonderful and it is right our land's got all those things we got brooks of water we have fountains we have flow uh, we have valleys and hills and wheat and vines and barley and uh, fig trees and pomegranate and land of we have olive oil we have honey we have all these things this is not some mystical land this land is right in the heart of paganism i'm trying to remind you that because that's where they're going they're going to live in the land where pagan idolatry that's the way of life take a look around us guys this is the way of life here i mean you can't do and go anywhere it seems without running into some form of blasphemous idolatrous worship that's that leads people away from god constantly but he's telling them when you get there when you get to the good provision that I'm sending you to, you've been tested. You've, you've kind of come through some of this stuff. But I'm telling you right now, when you get there, verse 7, for the Lord is bringing you into a good land. Verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. He is preparing you for this place, but there's a warning. Why is there a warning? Remember, okay, fine, we'll remember that. That's that's easy. We we love the praise reports, right? Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. And that's absolutely correct that we should do that. But then comes the warning in verse 10. And it goes all the way till the end. When you have eaten and are satisfied, I'm sorry, the verse, the warning comes in verse 11. So you have 10 verses of Moses reminding them of the discipline that they received to prepare them to be ready. Verse 10 is the reminder when you get there, don't forget to bless God. And he's not just saying, Hey, thank you, Lord. And then we go about our business. This is a daily, ongoing, repentant heart, a contrite heart that's humble, remembering where he came from. Why? Because in verse 11, he says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Stop there for a second. Why? Because that's exactly what happens throughout the rest of the history. They forget every step of the way and we do exactly the same thing we forget we forget we forget and god reminds us god reminds us he's loving he's kind he's merciful he's long suffering we talked about uh, when couples get divorced what was i remember uh, i want to try and tie this to remember what was the punishment for um adultery stoning. right stoning death right because that's how serious God took it. So if, he, if, he, if that was the that was the the punishment, why didn't it happen to everyone? Because he's long suffering. Remember, we said it was seven hundred years of God taking adultery from Israel, the spiritual adultery, and he took seven hundred years before he finally divorced his his wife Israel, and then he remarried her. he's patient and so in the same way we, we get a little bit of reprieve because of we, we we have a few sins in our life and so we don't feel like God's really come after us and so we kind of get away with it and we don't mind continuing sometimes in that sin because we we feel like we get away with it but he's saying don't forget do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments But Peter tells us, remember, that the Lord is patient. That not everyone should perish. So this is why he's long-suffering. But he's commanding you to remember. Because otherwise, 
what happens is, verse 12, when you have eaten and are satisfied and, be, and have built a good houses and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The heath led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water out of a rock for you. He's trying to get us to remember because we often, often forget. We get so wrapped up in the details of our life. He's trying to keep us from relying on self. Remember back to verse 2, is it, or 3? Remember? He humbled you. And listen, he let you be hungry. You know, I remember, I, you, know, you guys know that I've been studying this thing about intermittent fasting. And one of the doctors, he says, and, and he says, do you know that fasting uh, has an effect on dementia patients? There are people who have dementia, schizophrenia, that if you withhold food from their diet and help have them fast they, they will actually because because of the ketones that, that start going th pumping through your body I guess your liver releases ketones and at some point and it'll actually it's better food for you than even the food that you eat and provides stronger nourishment for your brain and uh, they actually start remembering the and the schizophrenia starts dementia starts going away and so he suggests, uh, you know, you could, you could, if Granny is having dementia, and this is the way he says it, if Granny is having some dementia, just restrict her diet. But you can't do that, can you? Because it's, you know, someone will call DCF on you or Department of whatever. And, you know, but he's saying here that uh, in the same, uh, I don't know, maybe I lost my point there. <laughs> Um, that was a good one too Robert's your fault I blame you <laughs> anyway I'm just kidding <laughs> um, it was purpose to hunger yes that's what it was purpose to hunger um, but he knows that you're not going to die he knows it's okay it's not, I love you sometimes <laughs> 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 even more especially is what I mean <laughs> Okay, you know, well, let's just go from one pan to the other. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, okay, anyway, so, uh, and you can't write that kind of stuff anyway. So, uh, my turn, this is getting hot up here. <laughs> yeah, it's turning a red, I think. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, the, the Lord knows that you're going to survive. You're not going to die. He's going to see you through this. I heard a pastor say one time that if, the, if we just knew how long the trial was going to last. Like if someone said to you, you're going to go through the worst trial in your life for two weeks. Two weeks. And at the end of 14 days, you're going to come out of it and you're going to be just fine. You go, okay, I think I could do that. You know. But we don't know that, do we? And so we worry all the way through that thing. We worry, we grade over it, we just don't know, and what do we do? We don't trust God in his sovereignty. And it doesn't mean that he's gonna work everything out for your benefit in the always the positive sense. It does not always mean that. And obviously you guys are all adults here and you know that. You know that things don't always work out for the positive as far as maybe having that healing come through that we were praying so fervently for. It might, but it might not. That's on the Lord. He wills these things sovereignly and he has plans and we can't always see what those plans are. And they hurt sometimes. 
They hurt deeply. But he says, verse 11, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God. Please don't forget him. Verse 16. In the wilderness he fed you manna, by which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. And that's what we've been saying. He's trying to move you to the next place. He's trying to move you spiritually to the next level. Are you wondering why you haven't grown? Lord, I don't know why I haven't grown. Let the test have its endurance. Let it have its product, James says. Let it have its, let patience have its proper conclusion. Let you, let it grow you. Let God test you that, that he would do good for you in the end in that way. Verse 17, otherwise you might say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this well. You forget, you get proud. So many of us have so much. And it's okay if someone has wealth. There's nothing wrong with someone having a lot of money. But in that way, it's almost scary, isn't it? Because you might be tested a lot harder in that way. And, and, and the other way, uh, you, you, it could work both ways, I guess. You know, you could be tested in a negative sense. And God must hate me. He doesn't give me anything. That's a dangerous spot. I think it's just as dangerous as the other spot. But he says here in verse 18, again, but you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant. This is the reason. Look at That he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. His reason for helping is one, because he loves you, But it's also to show him faithful. It's to bring the, the proper honor and glory to him that he deserves. Because he's the one who's faithfully fulfilling his covenant that he made to Abraham. And yeah, they went to Egypt for 400 years and they were slaves. It doesn't seem like much of a fulfillment. And yet, here he's telling them, I'm doing this so you understand that everything that you get is to confirm the covenant that I'm giving, that I made with your fathers. And it shall come about that if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today. Moses right here testifies against any believer. Now he's speaking specifically to those Israelites. But these words stand as the testament to anyone who forgets the Lord, your God. Our God, I'll say, because I'm included in that. And go after other gods and serve them. And I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord made to perish before you. Remember I said earlier that he would remind them. And he did. Because now this is after the fact where they have judged those lands. They have judged those pagans who were doing infant sacrifice, child sacrifice, human sacrifice. And all those things, and they, the Lord judged them. They cleared them out of the land, and it was ready for Israel. Now he's saying, if you ever forget the Lord your God, I testify against you that you will surely perish. Like the nations before you, so you shall perish. 
and listen, this is the reason, and we'll close, because you would not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. That's the point. He delivered them because of his faithfulness to the promise. They were, part, they were specifically a part of, re, of redemptive history, right? And we know that it was ultimately fulfilled in Christ. All of that was to lead up to what was coming, which was Jesus. The coming of the Lord's servant in Isaiah refers to my servant, and this is who he's talking about, Jesus. But at this point, the revelation that they have is limited, right? They don't have the knowledge of Jesus, and even Moses didn't have the knowledge of Jesus, at least not in fulfillment. He didn't know what it all was going to be. And remember, Hebrews talks about, they call Hebrews 11 the, the chapter of the hall, the hall of Fame chapter of the faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, Noah. All them. They had faith in God. They had faith and belief and trust because they listened to the voice of the Lord their God. It must have been the strangest thing in the world to build an ark when everyone else in the world knew that there had never been rain. But he trusted the Lord. Abraham trusted that when he raised that knife in the air and he was going to plunge it in his chest, in his, the chest of his son, his only son, the son of the promise, on the way down. And he trusted that God was going to fulfill his promise. It takes some great faith to do that because they trusted. Lord, I pray that um, we would have the same faith and trust 